back to Emmanuel Kant. Last time was purely introductory, uh, trying to get a handle on his project, and uh, then on some terminology. Um, and what we were doing then really covered about the first 10 pages of the selection we have in Kaufman from the Critique of Pure Reason. Uh, I hope in your reading you've discovered the similarity. Not much point in my uh, trying to say that unless uh, it helps introduce you to that material. Um, today we want to look at his epistemology, his theory of knowledge, which um, will cover the two sections of the critique that he labels the transcendental aesthetic and then the transcendental analytic. Uh, the aesthetic having to do with sense perception and the analytic having to do with understanding. Um, it's because of um, concepts that we have in the understanding that we're able to make judgments. It's because of the a priori structures of perception that we're able to have clear perceptual ideas, sense perceptions, clear and distinct ideas of that sort. So uh, keep that uh, distinction clear. You notice that in the transcendental analytic dealing with understanding, uh, we're dealing with the faculty of thinking as distinct from the faculty of sensing. And uh, that, I would think, is sufficient in itself to distinguish the two. Um, his point is that uh, we don't start thinking in generalized or abstract terms about the natural world or the self, or even start thinking about God, uh, without um, having at least uh, some input uh, from um, the faculty of sensing, which precedes understanding. So that you find that um, Kant says that um, concepts without percepts are empty. And percepts without concepts are blind. You see, if a concept is an abstract general idea, and we've heard about abstract general ideas from Locke and Berkeley and Hume, <laughs> concepts like cause and effect, like substance. Um, but those concepts, those abstract general concepts, are empty and no content apart from percepts. That is to say, particular sense perceptions. But on the other hand, uh, percepts without concepts are blind. You see, they, uh, they have no meaning. They, they don't know where they're going. They don't contribute to anything. So we have to not only distinguish the faculty of sensing from the faculty of thinking, not only distinguish sense representations from abstract ideas, but we have to recognize that the sense representations are prerequisite for developing abstract ideas. Um, now, having said that, you can um, perhaps get a handle on this terminology that I've put over here, which um, he spells out in a particularly dense section. Um, you'll um, see it if you haven't discovered it already. Um, where the term anshan, I suppose literally insight, um, is the term that's usually translated intuition, where intuition is awareness. Whatever it is we're directly aware of is known by intuition. And of course, in the tradition since Locke, what we're directly aware of is our own ideas. So our intuitions are of ideas or sense perceptions. You see. Anshan, intuition. You'll find that term used throughout the critique. Keep its awareness in mind. Uh, it refers to the mental act of being aware, conscious of, the mental act as distinct from the mental content, which is what John Locke called an idea, a representation of something external. And uh, the act and the content are to be distinguished from the faculty, the capacity that we have to sense. Similar to the faculty. Sensibility is the way it's translated, which isn't a very good English term considering how we use the word sensible. It's not a very sensible term in that sense of sensible. Um, but I, I think if you recognize that these three terms um, have to do with um, the aesthetic, the transcendental aesthetic perception, remember that uh, the term aesthetic in, in German, in fact, in most European use, refers simply to sense experience, not just to the aesthetic in our narrow sense of it, the artistic or the beautiful. Uh, but in the literal sense of the Greek verb eisthenomai, which uh, the Greeks present realize means to perceive. The barbarians pick that up along the way. So um, the transcendental aesthetic, nothing to do with the arts. <laughs> this um, okay, so that was distinct from the transcendental analytic. Verstand is the term for understanding. Reference to the faculty, thinking. And the glyph, the concept, the abstract idea. Okay, so keep that um, terminology in mind. Now, um, perhaps that will uh, come clearer as um, you look at the next piece on the board. We're familiar with this rubric, ever since Descartes, that the mind is immediately aware of its own ideas, which are simply subjective representations of external realities, or purport to be such. And um, this framework is the one, of course, which um, Descartes, Locke, Berkeley all begin with, and Hume in a sense, but Kant as well. You see, Kant is assuming this uh, rubric, which uh, was part of that rationalist tradition in which he was raised, you remember, the uh, Wolf Baumgartner people who were post-Leibniz rationalists in Germany, was raised in that tradition, uh, but also part of the tradition of Hume, who awakened him from those dogmatic slums. So the very project he has is a project that arises within that tradition. 
The problem he's trying to handle is a problem that's posed by that rubric, if you like. That is to say, uh, how do we get the idea of cause and effect? The human empiricist says it isn't a priori. We don't get any idea of causal connection, causal necessity from experience. What we get is the idea of constant conjunction. And psychologically, we come to think of it as necessary. So um, he's starting with this. Well, right, now translate that into um, what Kant is doing. And if what we're talking about is um, ideas in the sense of sense perceptions, okay, then our perceptions of things, according to Kant, are the confluence of um, two things. The raw input, raw, unprocessed, sensory stimuli, on the one hand, and the form that the, the mind gives, that the uh, faculty gives to this. Uh, that is to say, uh, John Locke's claim that um, in sense perception, the mind is a blank tablet, tabula rasa, blank tablet, is false. It's not that we have innate ideas, like Plato said, or self-evident concepts like Descartes thought. But it's rather that the mind is sort of pre-formed to handle things sensorily. If you want an analogy other than a tabula rasa or a blank cake of wax on which things leave impressions, think of a violin case that's really made to fit the violin. Yes, or think of an ice cube tray, better still, into which the raw and processed sensory input flows and comes out, shaped, formed, so that you can get a mental handle on it. Yes, so um, the perceptual experience we actually have, what we actually experience, is formed, structured sense experience that somehow or other has come together in unified fashion. Now, um, notice how far-reaching that is. Our sense perceptions are um, uh, itty-bitty things, uh, according to Hume. Uh, that is to say, um, we receive simple impressions. Beep, beep, beep. No connections between them, no relationships given. They're completely atomistic. How then do we perceive those three beeps as one when they're speeded up? You know, how do we get from A to C? We do. You see? And of course, the physiology of perception seems to be in terms of um, stimulus, atomistic stimuli to the sense organs. So in terms of the atomistic nature of sense impressions, there is no uh, coherence, unity, structure, or order. Um, and then, of course, we have five different senses. With no given relationship in the human tradition, no given relationship between the eyes and the ears, the nose and the taste. And yet somehow or other, uh, warm, delicious food, all five senses are involved at once. The color, the smell, the texture that you feel, you taste it. The sound of it sizzling as it comes to you. you see, it's all one. Are you ready for it? <laughs> uh, what we have is unified sense experience. You see, that's why um, Aristotle talked of a, an additional sense, the sensus communis, the sense that is in common to all five senses. Well, somehow or other Kant is trying to explain the same sort of thing. Uh, the uh, cohesion, the unification, the interrelatedness of all the atomic bits in one more holistic sense experience, sense perception. So then, if the um, empirical input comes to us um, atomistic, Bombardment. One booming, buzzing confusion bombarding you every sense. Somehow or other, this gets sorted and ordered. So um, our faculties must provide some sort of structure. A filter. Lens. Whatever metaphor you want. Well, and the same is true when you come to understanding, because the, uh, the perceptions that we have provide perceptual experience. But how do we get from individual perceptual experiences to general abstract ideas? Um, to the sorts of concepts that the understanding works with. Well, um, he maintains that once again, the, the mind is so equipped, so functions. Remember that Hume had talked of the, soul, the mind's proclivities. You see? The Scottish realists, the mind's proclivities. Kant is thinking that way too. He, he talks of faculties. But the mind has, has the capacity to provide structural principles that enable us to conceptualize what is going on in the world of perceptual experience. And what the understanding does then is to formulate uh, judgments about perceptual experience. Different kinds of judgments, different categories of judgments. So you formulate causal judgments. Yeah. You make quantitative judgments. That is to say, is everything like this or just some things? Okay. But you make different kinds of judgments because you've learned to, to conceptualize, to categorize. And the categories are not empirically derived by what the mind provides. It's nothing in experience to provide you with categories. And again, if the notion of categories seems new, it ain't. Uh, remember Aristotle had his categories. Substance, quality, etc. Ten categories of thought. Ten categories of being, you see, corresponding to each other. Uh, categories are simply ways in which we think. Um, so that the mind is not just a random thinker, but it's a channeled thinker. We think along certain given channels. This is the way we're made. Um, it's not only the Newtonian world of physics that is ordered. It's the mental world that is ordered. In, in fact, the order is transferred by Kant to the mental world, because it turns out that these categories are really Newton's categories. Newton's concepts. 
to the structure of the Newtonian universe is a structure we have given to it. Whether that's the way it is there in itself, we don't know. We, we structured the world that way. We talk of it in terms of space, time, cause, effect, matter, substance. There are categories. So um, uh, he's working with this Cartesian framework, but instead of the mind being passive in the whole business, as it was for Locke, the mind is the active contributor. You see, it's the mind that structures experience and thought. It's the mind that creates its own meaningful world. Whether the world is, it, is in itself is meaningful, we don't know. But by the time we experience it and think about it, it's at least meaningful to us. That's why science is possible. What science is talking about is the world as we experienced the phenomenal world. Not necessarily the world as it is in itself, the phenomenal world. Okay, now that's intended to tie in uh, this new step today to what we were talking about last Friday. Does that do it? Okay. Questions? Comments? Before we look at it in more particulars. Run. The categories which we have in our minds that have given us this important outlook through which we process this and that in address in this way, we can't say that these are universal or one of them. Yeah. Well, you see, it is these forms and categories that he says are a priori. And a priori for him means that they're universal. They're not just cultural. They're universal and they are necessary. That is to say, we cannot think otherwise. There's a logical necessity to it. So um, that, um, that simply explains why it is everybody sees things like. Yeah. Differences of individual experience don't change the fact that we all have spatial experience. We all think in causal categories. That's always there. Can't avoid it. Why couldn't Hume avoid it? <laughs> there you are. You can't avoid it. Okay. David? Yeah, yeah, that, that's a good point to make. That um, whereas the categories for Kant are simply categories of thought, for um, Aristotle, they are categories of reality as well as categories of thought. Um, so for Aristotle, you've got a corner on reality, which is why Aristotelian philosophy on through the Middle Ages didn't really have any epistemological problems. You see, if you've got categories of thought that coincide with the structures of reality, then um, what is rational is real. What is real is rational. You've got a corner. Kant doesn't deny that our categories are the categories of reality. He says we have no way of knowing. You know, how do you know if the tree that falls in the forest when there's nobody around here, you know? <laughs> it's the same sort of thing as with the... How do you know? Yes, sir? Right. It's the same. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So how would Kant respond? Well, I think he'd be surprised that there were non-Euclidean geometers. <laughs> <laughs> I think that would be his first response, because uh, non-Euclidean geometry is a product of what, late 19th century? Uh, I think I'm right in that. Uh, Lobachewski and Riemannian geometry, uh, wh which differ from Euclidean in that the fifth postulate is different. Euclid's fifth postulate, you remember the parallel straight lines never meet? Well, in uh, non-Euclidean geometries, they either converge or diverge. And as a result, um, you get all sorts of queer by Euclidean standards results that are far more useful than Euclidean geometry when it comes to vast reaches of outer space. You see? So non-Euclidean geometry does have its use. Uh, when you're dealing with what's called the curvature of space. Um, well, uh, obviously, Descartes' philosophical method was the method of Euclidean geometry. Newtonian physics made use of Euclidean geometry. The science of optics, which was the moving force in um, the development of physics on the continent of Europe. Remember, Descartes did work in optics, and nodes are ground lenses that were in the living, while he applied the methods of geometry to philosophy. Um, well, what we can't say apart from being surprised. Um, I think he would probably um, respond in uh, one of two ways. Uh, one, he would say, oh, those differences are minor. It might require some fine tuning of my categories, but that's about all. Non Euclidean geometry isn't denying such things as substance and cause and effect. So, um, secondly, Kant might say, all right, then, um, uh, apparently I have to 